Lindsay's just, just getting the, the presentation up and running. But um, for those of you who have not met, um, I'm Rachel North and I'm the Director of Museum and Public Programmes for the Birthplace Trust. So I listened to the last bit of Jan's talk with, with avid interest. Um, <laughs> Jan actually came to one of our stakeholder meetings with mm -hmm. you, and so Jan's heard some of this before um, and has very kindly um, invited me to come tonight. So my mission really is to give you a bit of a whistle-stop tour through some of the things that are happening with the Birthplace Trust this year and our year in particular of programming in relation to the women that made Shakespeare, and I'll talk a bit more about that. I'll share with you some of the events and activities that we have planned um, and a little bit about what I've been up to this morning in celebration of Shakespeare Week. There should be some time at the end for questions, so I'm very happy to answer anything that you that you wish to ask and I'll do my best to answer it at the end. Um, I think so, without further ado, there are lots of pictures and there's, there's lots of words, but I'm going to keep it nice and light, hopefully. And I should say at the outset, although I am a very passionate reader and um, theatre goer, I am not by any means a Shakespearean, so I should be telling you about our museum programmes, um, but I wouldn't have to answer any Shakespeare questions that come my way, but Paul's here if I need to defer. <laughs> <laughs> and Lindsay's going to be an able assistant, and I'm going to say next slide please, Lindsay. So yes, a little bit about what to expect in 2024. And I think this is Henley Street um, pre-pandemic. <laughs> uh, what I have noticed is that we've been getting busier and busier. Um, and you, some of you might have questions about that later, but I should say we're, we're still not at pre-pandemic numbers for our visitors, but lots more people are coming back. Lots more people from across our region as well. Not perhaps quite as many international visitors as we had before the pandemic, but we hope that they will return too. Um, and what's great is that certainly on, on busy weekend days, Henley Street has much more of a buzz about it now than it than it did for a little while. And hopefully some of you will have noticed that too. Um, but as we've approached the last few years, as well as focusing on getting the sites reopen again and as well and looking really wonderful, we've also been thinking about how we can better engage with our audiences. And so key to our approach for the future will be really to take an audience-led approach and to think very deeply about what our visitors from across the world, but also closer to home, want from the sites. We have to develop more of a family offer. There is lots of work to do. I appreciate that. I know some of our visitor experience needs a lot of work, but we're trying really hard and we're injecting lots of new ideas and creativity and that's what I'm here to talk about today. So if I give you a few um, sort of tasters about what this year's programme is going to look like. Having introduced myself as a, a museum professional, I love objects. I love material culture. Across my career, I've worked in museums, in museum basements, and I have been privileged to get my hands on all sorts of wonderful objects. And I'd like to share that with our visitors. So whilst we clearly need to take care of our collections, and most of them will always need to be displayed behind cases, we have a lot of handling objects too, like this Bellamine jug, for instance. And actually it's wonderful for our visitors to be able to handle those. So we will be having object handling sessions throughout the year, but particularly in the summer holidays when we have lots of families around, so that people can really connect with the power of the real thing. They can hold a jug that's 500 years old. A child can look at a clay pipe and move it around and see how it's made. And the other thing that that's doing for us is it's also trying to be more accessible for visitors that have different educational needs or learning styles. I learn by doing things, for instance, we all learn in different ways. So it's really important that we can offer a mix of experience for all of our visitors and particularly those for whom English is an additional language as well. So we've already launched these, and these object handling sessions are going really well. But it's, as I say, it's about getting our collections out. And there's a theme that I'm going to talk about today, and a lot of what I say will be about getting our collections out and enjoyed much more. I also mentioned that we need to be more engaging for our different visitors and particularly for families. I'm a mother of three children and I say that um, because I know how hard it can be 
to engage young people of different ages in historic spaces. I know that sometimes you need to try different tools and devices to do that. And so one of the devices that we're going to be using is what we're calling Explorer Hemp Backpacks. And what they're also doing is encouraging our families to get outside. We have some great outdoor spaces and we're known for the Shakespeare family homes. And we rightly spend a lot of time thinking about how we must present them and represent them. But we also have nature on our doorstep and particularly the gardens at Anakin Ways Cottage are absolutely beautiful. So we are going to try and create a legion of nature or creative explorers. We're also going to be putting sustainability front and center. And that's important, isn't it? And we all should be doing that, but there are already lots and lots of climate action groups across Stratford. And for the last couple of years, we've played host to them on the Sustainable Shakespeare Day, which is a giant eco-fair or garden party um, in Shakespeare's new place. And we open that up and we have stands for local groups to come and talk about what they're doing to help promote green energy or biodiversity and all the other things. Sorry, if we could just go back one. You're slightly quicker than me, Lindsay, which is fine. I do tend to talk quite quickly. Um, so we have a launch of, um, of the big green month, which is May to June, and then we have the big green day. And hopefully some of you will come along, because it's really nice to see lots of local groups there as well and find out what other people are doing. And then I don't know what a moss breakfast is, but I'm quite <laughs> happy. I might, I might go along to the moss breakfast, but also bat walks as well. And it's trying to, again, find different ways to make our sites accessible and to explore areas of them which we haven't perhaps explored as much as we have we should have done in the past and to make them accessible for local people as well so the purpose of the moth breakfast is that people can pop in before they go to work and there's be some a cup of tea there as well and we can just try and encourage people who might not otherwise come to our sites to come and have a look Thank you. One of the other cornerstones of our um, calendar this year was going to be a um, new place and local artists. It's also something I'm really passionate about. Um, we haven't perhaps done enough as an organisation to work with local and talented creative people and producers um, on our doorstep. So my team have been going out and finding, establishing relationships with printmakers, with soap makers, with all sorts of different artists and asking them to come in every Sunday during the Warwickshire school holidays, and I say that because school holidays are so different now. Mm -hmm. So my children have different school holidays to my sister-in-law's children, just for my added inconvenience. But during the Warwickshire school holidays, every Sunday at New Place, we'll be working with local artists, hands-on experienced visitors, as it says there. But it's also included in the admission for New Place and free to CV37 residents. So we've got that back up and running. I don't know if all of you know about that, but, but please do come along to New Place because it is free for TV37 residents. And when I gave this talk to the stakeholder group that um, Jan came along to, I had a question about whether we would extend that to some of the villages because CV37 is just under the artificial um, grouping that was chosen. And it is something we're going to look into. I would like more local people to feel like the family homes are also theirs to explore. So if you have any thoughts or suggestions on that, then I'm very happy to, to listen to them. Thank you. I also just wanted to spend a few moments talking about Shakespeare Week. So I've told you a little bit about what's happening across the sites for our general visitors. But we are also a heart and learning organisation. And some of you might not know the numbers that are involved. So Shakespeare Week is our annual national celebration of all things Shakespeare in primary schools. And it is 10 years old today. So this is Shakespeare Week, we have just launched it. And over 10 years, we have touched the lives of approximately 12 million primary school children. And I do think that's an extraordinary achievement. I, I'm not here to, to, to PR um, the Birthplace Trust, I'm here to tell you about it. But I do think that's a really fab thing. So out of Stratford, inspired by Shakespeare, in half the primary schools across the land this morning and through the rest of the week, there will be resources, there will be activities designed to give young people a positive first impression of Shakespeare. Because if we get them young, 
<laughs> then they enjoy and they think about Shakespeare as a creative inspiration rather unfortunately as my teenage daughter likes to tell me as something that she just has to study for GCSE <laughs> so it's really key that we try and encourage that inspiration early on so this morning <laughs> in celebration of Shakespeare week did anyone see our flash mob on Henley Street thank you Paul <laughs> um, so we had 11 simultaneous flash mobs this morning and flash mobs for those of you who don't know are when groups of people who have been practicing a dance routine or a song or a, or a thing sort of find themselves a public space and then just spontaneously erupt in this performance <laughs> so spontaneously erupting in performance across the country this morning were primary school children and that's everywhere from Alnick Castle in Northumberland down to the Isle of Wight I was very lucky to be able to go to Westminster Abbey this morning so I saw a group of children from Hammersmith and Fulham who otherwise don't have an awful lot of access to culture who are a very diverse school absolutely brimming with energy and joy in College Green in Westminster Abbey, where they were joined by the Cathedral Canons and a group of drummers inspired by Henry V. And those children will go home and they will talk about it and they will talk about it to their grandparents and they will spread the news about Shakespeare. And throughout this week, there will be a range of those kinds of activities. We have a celebration event on Wednesday where we are going to be bringing Shakespeare Week home. There's an awful lot of what we do, probably you don't get to hear about very much because it happens across the country. But Shakespeare Week's coming back to Stratford this year. So there are lots of things happening in local schools in and around Warwickshire, and we are celebrating those schools and the work that they've been doing in an event in the Playhouse on Wednesday. And actually the lady that um, had an idea, which grew into Shakespeare Week, is going to be joining us. And so I think this is a really fantastic thing just to, and I wanted to mention it to you because it maybe is something that you, you don't know that the trust do, but it's really, really instrumental and, and powerful out there in the world. And it's a programme, Paul, I think you'll agree that we're all really proud of. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I did want to kind of share with you a bit about that. Before moving on really to the, the meat of what I was going to talk about today, which is our new programme theme which we're calling the women that made Shakespeare. Which <laughs> is the first time since COVID that we have been able to get ahead of ourselves, really, enough to think about a programme of activity, not just for one year, <laughs> but for three years. So we've set out quite a radical rethink. And by programming theme, I mean, all of our events and activities and our exhibitions inspired by and provoked by the challenge in the title. I'm also going to say, not to embarrass Lindsay, then that's not me. <laughs> I tried to get away with sending in a stock photo in to advertise this talk <laughs> because I don't have any nice photos of me. But Lindsay went and found one on the internet. So <laughs> thank you for that, Lindsay. <laughs> but, but yes, it kind of... Um, theme that we're looking at for the year and I wanted to tell you a little bit more about that because it's perhaps something you'd be slightly more interested in and hopefully you can come and visit across the next few years. Thank you. So I won't make you read all the text but essentially it was inspired by a conversation we had last year which last year was an important year not just as the anniversary the 400th anniversary of the publication of Shakespeare's first folio but also as the 400th anniversary of Anne Shakespeare or Nee Hathaway's death. And it, despite lots and lots of things happening and a poetry anthology, which Paul was uh, leading on, it, it kind of perhaps doesn't get quite the level of focus that we might like. And so we were thinking about what might inspire our programming theme. And we're quite a female in the conversation as well. And we had this idea that what we would do is we would think about all the stories of the women, in Shakespeare's life at the time, but also with the characters in the plays, and then the fantastic women who have helped shape Shakespeare's legacy. So we're going to approach this in three different ways over the next three years. But I think it's important because women's history has been harder to find. I always think about this, and I think there's a famous quote that talks about women's lives and history 
feeling like water in the records. And by that people mean that, well I certainly mean, that women's lives have been everywhere, of course they are, they're 50% of the population. And um, all of the time they were there, but have always made it to the historical record in the same way as men's stories have. So it's much harder to uncover and they have been sometimes hidden, often less explored. But we're going to try and find ways over the next three years to uncover them. But going back to our objects, going back to material culture, going back to art and literature and finding different ways, there are there is evidence in our archives and we'll talk about that a bit in a minute. It's not quite as easy to find. So we've had to flesh out the stories and find different approaches to them. And I think that we'd certainly, Paul, I hope you'd agree that it's been quite a creative journey to imagine the lives and to uncover stories and to retell them. And sometimes these are stories that we think that we know, but we don't read. So we're looking upon this as an exciting multi-year theme. And hopefully some of you will be involved in some of that in different ways. And it's even got its own mission statement, if we move to the next one. Um, so we felt that it was quite important, so thank you, that we tell the stories of women on stage beside the, behind the scenes, those who lived and worked during his lifetime and followed after him who have contributed to the ongoing legacy of William Shakespeare and his works. And then as far as possible, that we will support new female voice, voices and develop and deliver this programme as much as possible by female identifying people. But that doesn't mean that not the whole of the team isn't involved. And, and of course, all of them are, and actually our male colleagues are incredibly supportive of this and very much key to its delivery. So this isn't about cutting people out, it's about cutting people back in and what we're trying to do is is not to take Shakespeare out of the story and I really want to make that point but we're approaching him as a as part of his community and as I said 50% of that community were women and he was working at a time a lot of his career where there was a a female queen on the throne and he would have been inspired by those people around him if we don't share that other side, the 50% that perhaps haven't been told, we're not telling all of the story. So it is about shining a light on female voices who paid their part in the success, but it's adding to the Shakespeare story rather than taking it away and trying to reframe Shakespeare a bit as well, because we perhaps don't really see him as a father or as a husband as much as we see him as the writer. So this is about trying to find a broader context not trying to downplay his incredible role in the in a, as it says there, the canon of Western literature. So what does this actually what does this actually mean? So in the first year, we're going to look at the women closest to Shakespeare, those who were in his life and his household, and we're going to look at culture and gender and ethnicity in society. Importantly, and I love the word rebels there, we're going to look at women not just in their domestic sphere, but we're going to find ways to explore the other roles that women took on in civic life and as it, within industry and as healers, at all sorts of different ways so that we can talk about women's lives in that broader sense. And that's going to be the mission or the purpose of the exhibition. And we'll have a look at some behind the scenes photos of the exhibition in a minute. And then we're going to move on next year to the characters. And there's some fun to be had, isn't there? We can talk about the witches in Macbeth, or we can talk about the extraordinary characters that Shakespeare wrote in his plays for male actors that played them. And what does that mean? So we can have all sorts of fun on some of that. Um, and that's going to be a really important year, I think, for us. And I think we could be really adventurous in some of the stories that we tell. And then we're going to move on in the final year to the women who made Shakespeare famous. And this is where we get to have fun with people like Mary Corelli, for instance, in Stratford, but the, also the actors, actresses who have brought to life Shakespeare's stories on stage, the writers and creatives and the people today that are working to continue Shakespeare's legacy and what that means. So hopefully you agree it's, it's an interesting programme with different perspectives that we haven't explored, certainly at the Birthplace Trust, before. So in the first year, we have 
um, an exhibition, which soft opened this weekend. By soft open, I mean, we sort of open the doors. There might be some fine tuning to do. And once we've done that, we will invite you all in to have a proper look, but it is open to the public just now. So I'm going to share with you some of my snaps, which um, I'm not a very phot good photographer, so you'll have to forgive me, but it enables me to give you a bit of a flavor of what you might see. And the exhibition is going to be upstairs in Nash's house. For those of you who saw the folio exhibition last year, it's in the same spaces. So it's not enormous, I'm not going to oversell its size, but we like to think it's beautifully full. <laughs> um, in, in these, a series of rooms upstairs in Nash's house in Newcastle. But more than last year, I think, what we've really tried to do is follow some glorious objects, really interesting objects that enable us to tell those stories. And we're going to focus on five women. On Anne Hathaway, Mary Arden, Susanna Shakespeare, Judith Shakespeare, and Joan Shakespeare. But we're going to ask our audiences and have a conversation with our audiences about what they think they know about these women and try to put them wrong a little bit. Try to think about exploding some of the myths and some of the legends. Try to think about the kind of complicated misinformation. History's not always been very kind to some of these women, and the way in particular. I mean, I've read a number of Shakespeare biographies and some of those authors have not been very nice about Anne Hathaway. And we often get these kind of tropes about her as an older woman who almost tricked Shakespeare into marrying her, um, was only worthy of the second best bed, some kind of country bumpkin. Well, she was a country bumpkin that ran the one of the largest houses in Stratford which at the time would have been like running a small business. She was an organiser, she was a planner. She had all sorts of other kind of sidelines from business to, to civic life. Those are the stories we don't get to hear, but we hear about the second best bed. And we don't even really hear that in context about the bed being one of the most important objects that you could leave in a will. So actually it was, it was more of a sign of regard than anything else. So it's these hidden stories, these hidden lives, and we've called the exhibition Hidden Voices for a reason. It's to try and uncover that story of female agency that is otherwise perhaps not told. And we're gonna use soundscapes as well. So there's gonna be some sound and some atmosphere and try and bring you back to the sound of, of Shakespearean Stratford as we do try and unpick the varying and much more nuanced roles of the women in Shakespeare's lives. So this exhibition, as I said, will be using artifacts from the late 16th, early 17th century, exploring all of these different um, roles that women took on. The, the women that loved and supported William Shakespeare, the women that knew him best, and what their experience was, as far as we can know it. And I think it's fair to say we can't know all of it, but we can know more than we think if we look in different ways and in different places. So here are some snapshots. This is a quite small exhibition, but there's, there's some textual information, really useful imagery, and some fantastic objects, which we've selected very, very carefully. So we have the courting chair, or one of the courting chairs from our collection which visitors will be able to sit on. <laughs> Back to yes. being able to explore an object and be part of that and to think about those objects differently. I should imagine there will be a fair few selfies taken <laughs> over the course of the year. But this is this is helping us to rethink or reframe that story about Anne Hathaway um, and what the courtship with William Shakespeare was or wasn't. The courting chairs were part of a tradition of um, that kind of furniture which then became conversation seating which was about trying to keep young people apart but the performance of courtship so we're going to be asking our visitors to think about what courtship today and what that means to them whilst trying to unkick some of those the sort of misogyny i think behind the traditional stories of Anne of the ways courtship so we will imagine some of that but we also have some fantastic paintings on display and one of them here is the mother and child which is a really really beautiful painting. you can get very 
up close and personal to it and have a, have a look at it. The most extraordinary um, Dutch, we think, oil on panel. Fabulous costume that she's wearing and a really big ruff, mm -hmm. a really giant ruff. So that's more a kind of examination of, of one of the worlds of women, which is as child bearers, as child rearers. But that woman has agency. She's also presenting herself. She's using her costume and her clothing to say something about her status and her life. And we'll find that out as well throughout the exhibition about how women use different ways. They couldn't fulfill the same public role, but how they use their own costume and their own spaces to tell something about themselves and their view of the world around them. The display of objects that speaks of women's agency, of, of giving women that power back to think about their own role in a different way. And there really are some stunning objects in our collection which we're able to put on display again, and some of them haven't been on display for a little while. And one of them is this little medicine chest here, which we can't display open because it's too sensitive, but it is, again, it's an early 17th century object, a medicine or a spice chest. And this speaks to the idea of women in the household being expected or being capable of knowing a bit of physic, of knowing how which herbs they might use to treat family illnesses. And those being recipes that were passed down from women to women in a generation, inspired by stories around them, but also we've, we've got the, an image of Gerald's herbal there at the same time. So this was all something that was in the ether, but it was part of a woman's role in, woman's role in the household. I know that today, I'm still the one that has to put the plaster on my children's knees. <laughs> and that was, uh, it was ever thus, but women knew how to exploit the herbs and the, um, the even foods and spices differently so that they could keep their family well. And then we're going to be doing some object rotations so that there might be some different things to see. And also we can protect objects because they can't be on display all year round under quite high light levels without damage. So we will be putting a variety of different archive documents on display and a variety of different items of costume. And we have some fantastic items of costume in the SVT collections. And one of them you can just see in the top right hand corner, and that's what's called a plain cap. So that's sort of everyday wear cap. But we will also be getting out a series of coifs over the years, over the year. And coifs were the little caps that sat quite tightly around your head that covered your hair if you were a married woman. And again, we might think about that today with a 21st century lens and think, well, women had to cover their hair and that's quite disempowering. Well, yes and no, because they used those choices in the coifs that they wore and the way that they were embroidered to make statements about themselves. So by changing the way they were embroidered or using symbols, they could say whether they were a romantic person or a humble person and, and people understood symbolism in a way that we don't understand today and we're going to be talking about that for children who come and visit as well so one of the last things that you'll see as you walk out of the exhibition is a lovely sort of magnetized board where there's a picture of a cat or a coif and children are asked to well anybody in fact doesn't have to be children i'll always have a go at these things um but asked to pick the different embroidered motifs that they would choose to represent themselves and it's quite interesting so we were talking about representation in clothing and then getting out some of the absolute stunners of the archive collection, which feature either the signatures or the marks of some of the women in Shakespeare's life. But there again, and I am no expert in this, but I think they're really interesting. And I think they also challenge us to think differently. So we sometimes think that if you leave, if you left a mark on a document, rather than a full signature, automatically made you illiterate. It's much, much more nuanced than that. It may be that those who left their marks, in this case, a, a woman, it was Judith, couldn't write to the same degree. Maybe they could and they just left a mark that day. Or that actually they were more adept at reading. Or certainly they would have had a different range of intelligence and would have been much involved in sharing stories and bringing up children and educating those children. 
So the idea that someone left a mark and it sort of downgraded them in, in the intellectual sphere is just, it's not quite right. So we're going to be getting those objects out, those documents, and encouraging us all to have a think about whether women's literacy has been presented quite as fairly as it should have been. And this is one of my favourite bits of the exhibition. Um, and it was really carefully considered by our team, and I'm taking absolutely no glory for this. I was not involved at all in this. Um, the curatorial team put this all together. But this is a, a tableau, really, of different objects which talk to all of the themes that I've mentioned. So we have an, a, a money chest, and we have some coinage on display so that you can see that women were involved in household expenditure. There's a bushel measure, measure there as well. There's a medicine jar, but also there's a child's really beautiful turned bobbin um, high chair from our collections as well. And then another really wonderful painting, well, there's two in this one, but the, the one I particularly enjoy is the family saving grace. I don't know if anyone, any of you have ever seen that at Hallscroft, um, but it's one of the standout paintings in the Birthplace Trust collection. And again, it sort of helps us to think about the different roles women play. So it was a patriarchal society and clearly the, the men are there at the front of the table. But it's also helping us to think about what the role of the matriarch was. She's front and centre in this image and she would have prepared and set out the menu for that feast. She would have been actively involved while staging that performance because that kind of feast would have been a performance. So women of the day have different roles than we often get them credit for. And that's the, the, the message that we're trying to display with this kind of rich tableau of objects and also the words in the background. So we do have, these women were wives, they were mistresses, they were daughters, they were housewives, they were maidservants, all of these different things, but all at the same time in some cases, not just one role, but a variety of different roles. Rachel, I, I yes. just point out that um... I was reading something a few weeks ago where uh, Anne uh, actually was a master of managing tax. She may have not been brilliant at writing, mm -hmm. almost illiterate, but she was brilliant with the numbers because she was found with 88, I think they're half hundred weights, there's an unusual nomenclature, of malt yes. stored in the back. Yes. And she had, they, they occasionally from time to time, they demanded tax on these things. Well, she managed to avoid paying so much tax. <laughs> I don't know how, yeah. but she cleverly uh, made sure that um, it was the minimum amount of tax necessary. Um, that the whole country, because Warwickshire was particularly strong um, on the production uh, and sales of, of malt. Well, this is a really good example, and we do talk about malt making yeah. uh, just in that context, because these are kind of sort of industries that happened in the home that enabled women to make some additional money to bring more revenue in but it was quite a female-led business and the other thing that is important to note as well often about women in industry and across their lives is that often women only become known to us when they were widowed mm -hmm. so these kind of records that you talk about that I've talked about generally come to light when they are widowed because that's the moment when they are granted an object or a series of objects in will and there's a physical record it's also a time in their lives when maybe their agency changed, when they had more freedom to go out into civic life in a different way. I think that's quite interesting too, but no, that's a really great example, Matt. Um, and yes, we do talk about malt making a little bit, and I quite fancy some tax advice. But yes, yeah, so all of those kind of stories we're trying to pick out with some of these objects. In fact, I think we have, Paul, I can't remember, you might know better, but we have got a malt making um, We've got some malt and things, haven't we? And we talk about that in the exhibition, I believe. It's mentioned, yeah. yeah. We've, got the, we've got the bushel measure there. Yeah. You know, it, was, it was made in, weighed in bushels. So all of that sort of comes to light a little bit. We've also got a silver, you can't see it in here, but we've got a silver gilt bowl talking about women being given objects in wills. The silver gilt bowl being the object that Judith was given, Judith Shakespeare was given in will. So we sort of talk about that sense of women arriving in our historical record, um, either at the time of someone's death or when they became widowed. So all of this kind of tries to come out in some of the objects that we're putting on display. 
And I'm going to pause there for a minute and just see if there are any more questions about the exhibition or some of the work that we're doing. And then I was going to tell you a little bit more about some of the projects that we've got and, and open it up to questions more widely. So anything about the programming and the, the exhibition that anybody wanted to mention? I think it's brilliant. I just wanted to say that I've been making notes and I'm going to go along to all of them because <laughs> I'm really keen on, it, on all of those because I've got children too. They've yes. slightly grown up now. And when I was young, I did not appreciate Shakespeare. I had to get to the furthest away university I could go <laughs> to get away from Stratford. But I've now come back and to see um, Shakespeare being made real mm. it is what's been needed for a long time. So, brilliant. Well, good. I'm saying I went to Warwick University, so I didn't disappear very far. Oh, no, no, no. Uh, but I think I probably followed a similar trajectory and that Shakespeare's been with me all my life as far as I can remember. I remember studying him at school, I remember reading out loud, I remember the terror of trying to, I think I had to be Flewellen once. Mm -hmm. in, in, um, but there's something really powerful about understanding the personal life and the bit that the Birthplace Trust can tell and that Stratford particularly has the opportunity to bring to life is that broader context. We have the home Shakespeare. We have this fantastic collection. We have a million objects, designated collection, one of the finest collections in the country, certainly one of the leading Shakespeare collections in the world, here in Stratford. And we have the Shakespeare family homes. So where else would you go to learn about the life and times of this man? And I think that's incredibly powerful. But even more powerful, if we can try and tell those stories slightly differently, if we can provoke a bit, and if we can have a conversation with visitors, which actually empowers people to ask questions or to take a different approach. And that's one of the things that we'd like to do more as the Birthplace Trust. We're not Fortress Shakespeare. This is a conversation that we want to have with people. We want to be much more inclusive and welcoming for all visitors of all ages, of all <laughs> interest levels, actually. So if we can pique any interest at all, that's a good thing. And actually, the other thing that I think, we had some experienced designers from Australia who were great. And they came over and they were looking at everything that we do and helping us to plan for the future. So we are starting to do that much more. And they came up with something called Shakespeare and, which ultimately might be a new way for us to think about our digital offer. But the premise is, there is nothing in life, universal nature that you cannot connect back to Shakespeare. <laughs> and we tried throwing it at them. And they were like, yep, yeah, and that. Shakespeare and nature, Shakespeare and gender theory, Shakespeare and everything. There was a way into all themes, all creativity, and actually all thinking and humanity through Shakespeare. And that's why we're still here thinking about Shakespeare today. Mm -hmm. That he was the most humane, critical thinker that we have ever come across, I think. So hopefully we're just finding new ways to inspire a new generation of people to think. Can I just say, actually, one of the things I think about, particularly in the place when you're there, mm -hmm. particularly in the evening when the lights were on in Guild Chapel, that was the view that he had from yes. his retirement home yeah. when he was writing some of you know, the Tempest and some of those, those, those sort of big places. And whenever I'm there, looking across there, you've got that fantastic connection between that guy was sitting there looking at that, and I wonder what he was thinking when, when he looked at it. And you can and walk I, on those yes. cobbles, can't you? Yeah. Absolutely. And the other really important thing about that that we'd like to do more of is to connect those different spaces. So I'm really conscious that we talk about the Shakespeare family homes and the Shakespeare connect collection from the position of the Birthplace Trust. But we are only part of the Stratford story. And I have this conversation very regularly with the Reverend Patrick Taylor. Um, but it's true, <laughs> you know, whether it's the Guild Chapel, whether it's Holy Trinity, whether it's the schoolroom, or all the places around Stratford, actually the cage up on the corner of the street. Mason's Croft. Exactly, Mason's Croft, all of these places. And what we need to be doing more as the Birthplace Trust mm -hmm. is inspiring our visitors to go out and discover and creating links we have got a little ticketing partnership, for instance, with the schoolroom, with Lindsay at the moment, which is working really well. I would like to reinvent the idea of the trust being a hub for all the spokes going out to all of these different spaces, because we can't tell all of the story. Yeah. Uh, just an observation, but, um, you've got the schoolroom, you've got the theatre, you've got yourself. Mm -hmm. 
And um, just a few years ago, we all had projects that you wish to raise money for, and you competed in the bidding. Right. Until since uh, came in, and you all sat in a corner and agreed and we necessity it, and you did it in order and supported one another, and you all got the money you wanted. It seems to me the message is so much more powerful, mm -hmm. the more integrated you are with the theatre, the more integrated the school. Mm -hmm. And I'm hoping that, I, I think what you're proposing is super, what you're doing is not proposing is super. But where's the theatre in this? Yeah. Where's the school in this? Patrick in, in, in home. That's it, that's, I think, should be, uh, there's enough people around you to make that happen. You know, do it together. I, I completely take that challenge and I think it's a fair one. And I, I offer a couple of little points. One in support, so that I recently had a conversation with Arts Council England about our future vision for the Birthplace Trust and our museum vision. And they said something very similar, that we're two huge entities in Stratford and we need to work together. And, and Jackie and I are very aware of that too. I have a close relationship with, with Jackie O'Hanlon at the RSC. So yes, we do need to do more of that. And then about how we can do more tangibly now. So one of the things we're going to do in the summer with this Women Who Made Shakespeare programme is try to see if we can pop up in different places. So that it's not all happening behind a paywall or in our sites, that actually we can put some information or displays in Holy Trinity and it's something that Patrick and his team and, our, and my team are talking about. But wouldn't it be great if we could get things in windows or in other, you know, in and around the town? pop-up art, work with local artists. What would Judith Shakespeare look like today? Put a picture in a window. You know, it, it could be going out and about much and more. Course, that's what the local art people yes. are doing in Debenhams, mm -hmm. etc. Exactly. And they on windows. Mm -hmm. And there's a thing for it, because we did the global street art windows. For those who yeah. you know Henny Street, right at yeah. the top, yeah. former Edinburgh Wooden Mill windows. Mm -hmm. They look absolutely fantastic, but they are approaching the end of their tenure. I would like to work with local artists to come and think about ways that we can explore this theme with artworks in those windows, but also to get them around Stratford a bit, because we do have lots of blank window spaces and other things we can use. So we're on that. Um, but it would be nice if we did that in partnership with some other groups, Escape Arts, for instance, who do the Debenhams window, are, are some people that we're going to talk to. There's no shortage of ideas and creativity, but it's sometimes just the pace we need to put them all into practice, but all good challenges. Yeah. Yeah. We're um, hoping to get the yes. couple of windows in Henley Street yes, you are. in association with ARC to advertise the Mario Crelli mm -hmm. centenary that we're heavily involved in. So hopefully that's going to happen. I, I'm, I'm sure we can make that happen somewhere or other. We need to quietly exit the global street art windows which is we will do um and then yes we'll open it up for your suggestion and also for arts rising so vince and his team yeah, at arts rising what to do. yeah yeah, yeah. Awesome. rachel can i just ask you um the, the women who had an influence in shakespeare's life mm -hmm. most of them i can think of are very closely associated with properties yeah. in the town yeah most of which you run you own, but you've closed them. You've closed three of them some of the time. Two, are, two I can think of are fully closed. Um, but wouldn't it be a very um, opportune thing to do as part of this project to open these? I mean, from a tourism point of view, they need to be open. And what's what was the trust's proposal? Well, I will say a few words in answer to that because it's it's a good question. I know it comes up from time to time. So, Mary, I I would take um site issue with them being closed i think that they are open but in different ways and by that i mean mary arden's farm for instance is open to the public during the summer we had a whole program last summer and we will have another program this year of community days of events and activities everything from pumpkin carving at halloween to family days that the whole program of opening that has been happening at mary arden's farm and increases year on year but the other thing that it is also doing at the minute is it's home to our primary learning team. And six or 7,000 now primary school children from our area and beyond have used Mary Arden's Farm for their learning sessions. 
because we're not able to use the Shakespeare Centre in the same way at the minute, and we can talk about that in a little bit if there's time, but we are having to recite our primary learning team and they are housed down at the farm. But actually there's an awful lot of energy that goes into delivering an, a, a public access programme at Mary Arden's Farm. So I wouldn't deem that to be closed. Paul's Croft is in need of conservation. I'll be very honest with you about it. It has been in need of conservation for quite a long time, but the good news is now that's happening. And we have started, there will be a long journey ahead because there's an awful lot of work to do. Millions and millions and millions of pounds need to be spent on various parts of the building, but that work has started. So we're not able to open it in the same way, but it is good news on the long in the longer term because we are conserving that amazing property. In the meantime, we are also finding different ways to open it. So we have a garden opening program this summer with some work going to talk about this idea of women as healers as a physic garden. So we have a project that's going into Waltercroft Garden, which will be opening. And we also have our tertiary or our university learning that happens in Waltercroft. So I get what you mean, and I'm like, you know, I absolutely understand the question, but I would say that they are being used and utilized in different ways than perhaps they were before, but still really important. I would for them for, for casual opening to the public visitors. Casual opening. Casual. <laughs> Not at the moment, no. It's it's going to be part of an annual programme, but still quite an expansive annual programme. That's for the foreseeable future until we... It's like a moving... You know those jigsaw puzzles where you move one piece, but you have to keep moving it to make the whole. We're moving the pieces around to try and get to our big picture for the future. I appreciate that that doesn't necessarily provide you with the casual day-to-day -day opening that you were thinking about. Yeah. I still think there's quite an important programme of public opening then. I, I've got one, I know I keep asking questions. If, if we did want to visit one of these properties, can we approach somebody? I, I've got your email address or somebody, but if I could just... just... Um, contact somebody just from a historical point of view. Absolutely, they're always open for researchers as well. Yeah. Um, all, all the time, and we can make appointments for that. And that public program is going to be on it if it's not already on our website, will be on our website. And there's a whole there's pretty much every weekend during the summer, for instance. So it's not you know ad hoc. There's a, there's an awful lot of activity going on. Okay. There's a couple more, and then yes, yeah, talking about the women who made Shakespeare. What about the dark lady? <laughs> what can you say about her? Well, probably very little, because I'm probably not the expert to, to ask about this. doesn't feature in this particular exhibition, because we're trying to focus on the women close, the five women closest to Shakespeare. And and the, uh, the current conversation about Shakespeare's sonnets mm -hmm. is that the dark lady you know, it, she just never existed in the first place. <laughs> so I've been trying my hardest over the last 25 years to murder her. Stanley Wells and I are succeeding in, in uh, thinking, can, can we please have a different conversation about Shakespeare's sonnets rather than a tired of you know, biographical approach, which assumes far too much of those remarkable and very uh, uh, differently toned poems. Um, there's no dark lady there. I mean, um, she she remains a fiction, a figment of bio, the biographical uh, imagination. Well, there you go. You had a very round. <laughs> it's far more articulate and provocative yeah. than I might have come up with. Um, so I think that's probably oh oh you oh I just want to underline CV thirty seven yes because you know I think everyone in this room can pass that message on yeah. and say to neighbours. You, you, did you know you get free entry into a new place? And that lovely garden at the back, you know, on a sunny day, you just turn up and you say, I've seen you there, bring a utility bill, whatever you have to do. Oh, this is great. This is yeah. every day, not just every day. Every day. day. Yeah, every day. Yeah, no, every day. The, the events that I talk yeah. about happen on Sundays. That was so popular in the town. Yeah, yeah. 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 I mean, okay, we get well, you yeah. can't just pop in down the side gate anymore. <laughs> we get that. I mean, we've you know, had, that, had that story. But, so the, but the offer to the visitor, it's fantastic at New Place. When I go around there with a group of you know, 15 undergraduates from yeah. a, a university in the States, say, 
we, ne we never seem to have long enough because you, the more you get put into the site, and there's the garden at the back, and there's the exhibition upstairs, and you can spend ages there. Mm -hmm. And you can just pop it in the garden and you know enjoy the garden. I completely agree, and I think Jenny's right, that view just is the one way you can really imagine yeah. to experience narcissism. Yeah. So yes, it is every so, single so day. Please, so please help us pass that message on to yeah. society, because yeah. that would be a very mm -hmm. you know, benevolent thing for this, this organisation to mm -hmm. do. Yeah. I think so. if, if anybody else has any questions, queries, things that they want to raise that they don't want to raise in this, I'm I'm very happy. I think Lindsay and Jan have my email. I'm very happy for you to pass that on. When we have sort of let the exhibition rest for a few days, we'll have a think about timing a um, official opening, and we'll invite as many people as possible. And we certainly have one of our stakeholder meetings there, Jan, so everyone can have a. Have a look. Jan's already mentioned found a spelling mistake, so we will just we will work Sorry on that. that. It's absolutely but this is what happens when you put these things up. Um, but if you do have any thoughts when you go around or you want to chat to someone about it, just let me know. What about the records off of something? Is it going to happen again? Yes, I mean we are open at the moment, but the the amount of access that we can provide to the current reading room is limited for various reasons to do with ventilation and keeping people safe and the way that the, the building is challenged at the minute. So it is limited and we appreciate that, but that's part of the bold decision we're taking to temporarily move the collection just up the road to Avenue Farm. So it's, I could probably walk it in five minutes, but maybe 10 to 15 minutes on the bus route. We keep in the collection in Stratford during that time and it enables us to rethink the Shakespeare Center. Because in the 1960s, Levi Fox and the, the team then completely imagined the Shakespeare Centre for their time. We now need to do the same. <laughs> Sticking plasters and bits here and changing an old boiler over here that isn't, I mean, the, we can't get the parts for the boiler. <laughs> the, the, seriously, the, the generators need to be in the Science Museum. It's done incredibly well, but it's a really challenged building. And if we don't take this bold and radical move, move the collections out, we will never get the Shakespeare Centre for our time that we does all deserve. So yes, the collections are moving a bit up the road, but in doing that, we're able to find a space which is much bigger, where we can put all of the collections in one space, not in a series of stacks, where we can purpose build the wrecking, where we can set the right environmental conditions, it has more car parking space and we can deliver much, much better access. So there will be much more access at Avenue Farm than we are currently able to provide. And I'm really positive about this project. I appreciate that it has had a sort of slightly mixed review, but unless you take these sometimes quite bold decisions, you can't make the progress you need to make. Just underlining again, Rachel, if I may as well, for the time being, if anyone's not aware of it, you can just turn up to the yeah, current reading room. Yeah. Monday to Wednesday, 10 till 3. You don't have to book a place. This has been the case since early December last year. Yeah. And it may not be that it may be that people are not quite aware of sure. that. You can just turn up and consult things. So it, it's you know Monday to Friday, Monday to Wednesday, 10 till 3. And then yes, in the in the new store, it's going to be far better for readers. And it's been, well, probably since 1964. And that's not a forever decision, but that's something we can do to do what we need to do to the Shakespeare Centre. When is Avenue Farm? So Avenue Farm, I'm not, I don't think I'm going to be quite drawn on the timelines because I'm not on the project team, but it's within the next 18 months. And we're going to continue providing access for as long as possible in the current reading room. There might be a kind of phased and very short closure period. We haven't yet figured out quite how that's going to work and the project team will. But if we've established pop-up exhibitions and displays and other means that we've been talking about today, we're going to try as hard as we can to keep that access going throughout the project. Mm -hmm. Avenue mm -hmm. Farm is, if you go up the Birmingham Road and you keep going, it's where all the sort of car dealerships and things are. Oh, it's that sort of light industrial estate. I know people say, oh, you're moving them to a warehouse. <laughs> museum stores across the land are in warehouses because they are the biggest buildings you can find to be able to create the spaces inside. So we're going to create boxes within boxes and it is just up the road. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, I can't, I can't suffer the tra traffic problems currently. <laughs> I'm going to I'm going to go on a date if that's all right. Yeah, I really thank you very much for letting me come and talk to you. you. <laughs>
Thank you very much. It's always um, interesting to find out what the Shakespeare Birthplace Trust think they're going to do, can do, hope they're going to do, and will do. I think we're all and I'm very sorry that I've picked up this typo. No, you're fine. I don't mind, honestly. <laughs> if it wasn't you, it would be me. So. No, well, there you go. Yeah. I'm just casually looking at uh, you know, the displays on after the uh, after hours on Friday, and there it was. It leapt out on me. So, <laughs> what what was it? Oh, it's just uh, an extra H. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. I used to be a poo feeder. These sort of things, you know. Spring out at me, there's nothing I can do about it. I always think it's a good thing because then we've got something we can do something about it. Do something about it, I okay. guess. Um, uh, what I didn't mention before Rachel started speaking was um, we've got a couple of things coming up. The Shakespeare Birthplace Parade, if anybody wants to be a part of the Stratford Society grouping, please let us know. And also the Mari Corelli Centenary celebration, we will need um, volunteers at the exhibition. So there's going to be an exhibition at Harvard House, courtesy of the SBT. Um, we're going to need volunteers for that. And, and or, you can mix and match, there's an exhibition at the Town Hall, which we're putting together. So if you want to be involved, please let us know either now or <clears throat> later through the um, through the website. Okay, I think that's it. But, but right. Before you yes, sorry, yeah, I've got one yeah. burning question I'd be dying to ask a group such a group as your expert selves. I have heard from a friend, a guy called David Cumber, that there is a tunnel underneath Bridge Street. But he can't get access to it. Does anybody else know if that's true? When whether one exists? They sell it. They sell it. They sell it exactly, yeah, which yeah. goes underneath the. Yeah, well, they sell it, which used to be there because it used to be a wine shop where BHS is. That's what I've heard. And, yes. Yeah, they got regularly flooded when the uh, yeah. when the river was. Yeah, I don't know about a, a, a tunnel. But a tunnel. Yeah. 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 <laughs> okay. Okay, that's it. Well, thank you all very much for coming. A successful AGM and look forward to next year's wonderful speakers. Thank you all. Thank you.